Greetings. Uh, my name is Naveen Pereira. I'm assistant professor of cardiology and pharmacology at the Mayo Clinic. And today on the heart.org, we'll be discussing adjunctive pharmacotherapy and coronary artery disease, specifically with an emphasis on anticoagulation and antiplatelet drugs, with my colleague, um, Dr. Guri Sandhu, who is the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at Mayo Clinic Rochester, and who specializes in percutaneous coronary intervention and uh, structural heart disease intervention. Welcome, uh, Dr. Sandhu. Thank you, Naveen. We definitely have some pretty topical medications to discuss today. They've both been in the news. Fantastic. So we'll get right into the news. Um, so uh, first of all, we know about all the traditional antiplatelet drugs that we've been using uh, for acute coronary syndromes, after percutaneous intervention, and stable coronary artery disease. Aspirin seems to be the mainstay. Aspirin irreversibly acetylate, acetylates the platelets. And then we have the P2Y12 inhibitors, specifically more commonly used as clopidogrel and the newer ones, the Caglor and Prasugrel. Mm -hmm. But there's a new kid on the block, if you may, and that is Vorapaxer. And Vorapaxer is a, uh, a protease-activated uh, receptor inhibitor. Right. Um, uh, Dr. Sandhu, can you elaborate on this uh, newer mechanism of an antiplatelet yeah. agent and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Vorapaxer and its mechanism of action? So this is an entirely new class of agents, and Vorapaxer was recently approved by the FDA for clinical use. This medication, as you just mentioned, works via the protease activated receptor pathway. And the mechanism is basically once the coagulation system gets activated, thrombin will irreversibly activate this receptor. And that sets off the usual G protein based intracellular activation that activates the platelets. So the hope is by inhibiting this receptor, we will reduce platelet activation. And this medication has been approved for secondary prevention. Wonderful. And it it basically uh, has come into the news recently because the FDA approved Vorapaxer, and my understanding is uh, the approval uh, came after a consensus. There was a vote of uh, 10 to 1 in favor of approving Vorapaxer um, yeah. for uh, patients uh, uh, with, to pr for secondary prevention in coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease. Um, the basis of this approval uh, came from the TRA secondary prevention TIMI-50 trial. Right. Uh, Dr. Sandhu, could you uh, tell us a little bit about this trial, uh, the kind of patients that were involved, yep. and uh, the basic findings of this trial? So essentially, this was a pretty large trial. They had about 26,000 patients, all with stable atherosclerotic disease. And they had three subgroups. The first subgroup was patients who had had an MI within the past one year. The second subgroup was cerebrovascular disease, so patients who had had a TIA or a non-hemorrhagic stroke in the past year. Okay. The third subgroup was patients with peripheral arterial disease. Okay. So these patients were placed on either a placebo or Vorapaxer, and the usual outcomes of MACE death, stroke, need for urgent revascularization, and uh, other criteria were looked at. And were they allowed to take other medications? Um, they were also on their usual medications. Okay. And uh, one confounding issue here, which was brought up repeatedly, was that about 16,000 of these were on thionopyridines, primarily clopidogrel. Mm -hmm. So that may have affected their overall outcomes and results. So more than 60% of these patients were on clopidogrel, and so Vorapaxer was given an addition to clopidogrel in a large proportion of the exactly. patients in this trial. Okay. And uh, as the trial unfolded, DSMB actually stopped one arm of the trial. Those are the patients who had had a previous ischemic stroke or TIA because of a higher signal of bleeding, both 
moderate to severe bleeding as well as intracerebral bleeds. Hmm. Okay. And uh, were there a uh, certain weight range? I know with Prasugrel, for example, um, uh, patients of a certain weight were excluded because of higher risk of bleeding was was the same applicable in exactly this so it, it is trial. pretty much the same so when this drug was approved the two groups that were excluded from using this drug were patients below 60 kilograms in weight and also patients who had had a previous uh, cerebrovascular event okay so they looked at a composite endpoint right. uh, of that myocardial infarction stroke coronary vascularization mm -hmm. So can you elaborate a little more on the relative risk and the absolute risk reduction? And I think that's right. important because the relative risk reduction always sounds impressive, but when yeah. you look at the absolute risk reduction, uh, we may not be that impressed. So the relative risk reduction was 13%. Okay. And the number- With the use of Oropaxor. With the use of Oropaxor. So okay. the number needed to treat was 53. Okay. In terms of absolute risk, risk reduction, it was basically about 1%, between 10% to 9%. Okay, okay. And, and so, so there's some adjunctive benefit, it appears, um, but there may be an increased risk of bleeding. Um, yep. And so what, what, what do you, what's your take home from this uh, FDA approval and the results of the trial. Do you think it's yeah. going to change your practice, Dr. Sandu? Not immediately, because okay. the biggest concern is the risk of bleeding. There was a 4.2% rate of bleeding with the medication compared to placebo, which was 2.5%. So in balance, the risk of bleeding seems to neutralize any obvious benefit across the larger population. However, having said that, this is potentially a medication that could be individualized. So I think as we have more data, more evidence coming forth, we will probably find the right patient population. At this time, it is still an early stage medication. I think we need more evidence before we have any definitive conclusions. Right, and it would be nice not to have clopidogrel as a confounding factor in terms of antiplatelet right. agents. Absolutely. Okay. So, Dr. Sandu, let's move to a, another interesting topic of anticoagulation. We use a, uh, unfractionated heparin, uh, commonly in acute coronary syndromes, or low molecular weight heparin. There's this big controversy mm -hmm. of whether we should use bivaluridin. There's a trial that addressed this issue, the HEAT trial. Can you tell us briefly about this trial and give us the key findings? So, the HEAT trial was done in the UK where they randomized patients with ST elevation MI to unfractionated heparin versus bivalurudin. They had about 1,800 patients, mm -hmm. and their findings were a little bit controversial. Previously, bivalurudin had been shown to reduce the risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. In this trial, they showed that there was no difference between using unfractionated heparin versus bivalurudin. And on the other hand, the risk of stent thrombosis was a little bit higher with the use of bivalurudin. Mm -hmm. So this created a large amount of controversy and discussion, and I think the jury is still out on where this is going to go. So no differences in bleeding between unfractionated heparin and bivalurin. Exactly. And Any effects on MACE? So the effect on MACE seemed to be slightly lower with heparin. Huh. And coming back to the bleeding issue, all the previous large studies with bivalurin had mostly compared unfractionated heparin plus an intravenous glycoprotein inhibitor right. versus bivalurin alone. Right. And we know for a fact that glycoprotein inhibitors increase the risk of bleeding. Right. So those are utilized less commonly nowadays, so that is one issue that has been taken off the table in this comparison. The other issue is also radial axis is gaining predominance. Femoral axis management is better. So overall bleeding rates across the board are going down. So the difference is potentially less than it was seen in the previous studies. So what do we do at Mayo in general for patients with STEM uh, in terms of using heparin versus low molecular weight heparin versus bivalvuridin? So at Mayo, our practice for any acute coronary event is to use dual antiplatelet loading up front. Mm -hmm. So everyone will get aspirin with either ticagrelor or clopidogrel. And then in terms of the anticoagulant, our preferred approach is unfractionated heparin with appropriate levels of ACT. Mm 
and we will also selectively use an intravenous 2B3A agent for patient with slow flow and thrombus. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Sandhu. Um, so the HEAT kind of uh, HEAT trial results substantiate and validate uh, the approach used here. They do seem to fit in with what we have. So uh, th uh, thanks to Dr. Sandhu for these great insights and thank you, our viewers. We hope that you will continue to check out future content on Mayo Clinic's page at theheart.org on Medscape.